Welcome. Welcome to our morning service. And as you can see, I'm here in our church building here at All Saints for the first time since lockdown. I have checked the relevant guidelines and I'm able to do so. And I'm here with Rosie and with Katie, who are going to be reading and praying later in the service. If you are listening to this and you expected to be uh, tuning in, as it were, to our family service, then you're in the wrong service. Please do sign into that on Zoom at 10.30 and they would be delighted to see you. This service has been pre-recorded and will follow the shorter form of morning prayer uh, that many of us will be familiar with. Many of you will also have seen that churches will wonderfully soon be permitted to reopen for private prayer. The wardens and I are working on the practicalities of how we might be able to do that and hope that we may be able to open All Saints, maybe for a day a week in the not too distant future. And we'll announce more details about that when we can. We begin with the traditional greeting, echoing the Apostles' greeting to the Ephesian church. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. We're now going to sing our first hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. It's a recording from St Andrew's Cathedral, Sydney, in the days immediately before lockdown. And I see, you'll, you'll see from the choir that it may give us a glimpse of what we can expect in our worship in song going forward. Let's sing.
Let me pray for us. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So let us confess our sins in repentance and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. And we say together, Lord God, we confess that we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy and in our song will praise our God. The Collect for the first Sunday after Trinity. O oh God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers, and because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace, that in the keeping of your commandments we may please you both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As far as our church family news uh, for this week goes, there'll be various uh, youth and children's events happening as usual. There'll be start the week prayers uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, otherwise, do have a look at the church notices online and you'll see what else is going on. I'm now going to hand over to Rosie, who is going to lead us in our prayers this morning. Thank you, Rosie. Ephesians 2 verse 14 says that Christ Jesus is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. Father, we thank you that this is true of our relationship with you. Please would you let this be true of all people in our world. With the current racial tensions worldwide, would your peace and protection be among all those affected? We are sorry when we don't treat others as yourself, as ourselves. Thank you, though, that through Jesus' perfect sacrifice, we are unconditionally loved, created equal with a secure citizenship in heaven. Please would we remember this truth even when the future is uncertain. In this difficult period of coronavirus, please would you be with the leaders of this nation. Would they look to you for wisdom and certainty as they face difficult decisions particularly in regard to easing lockdown restrictions. Please would this occur in a timely and safe way for all. We also pray that jobs would be protected as the economy changes in the coming months. Please would you be with all the key workers who are currently working to help others. Would you protect them from this virus and would give them a sense of peace and rest during these unsettling times. Closer to home, we thank you for the current work of Open Door, Taunton Beesum, Taunton Youth for Christ, and please would they help those in need and serve you. Please would you also be with the residents at Cannons Grove. Would this be a positive time where they are able to get their lives back together? 
would they also know that ultimately in you there is a secure hope and future. Finally, we pray for our church. Thank you for the technology that allows us to still meet together to worship you. Please would you have your hand of mercy and let us come back together. We remember, however, those who are isolated and lonely, and please would they know your comfort and strength for each day. In our church, we pray for Mary and John Guy, Anne Hancock, Val Warren, Derek and Eileen Power, Ali Norman, and others known to us. Please would you be with them all, helping them to get through whatever they are facing. Now we bring all these prayers to you by finishing with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosie. We're now going to say together the Gloria and the words will come up on the screen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please take up your Bibles, and Katie is going to read to us our next passage in Ephesians. So we're going to read Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. 
and I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations for ever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Katie. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts in all our hearts be now and always acceptable to you. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. From an early age, we rightly want to teach children the importance of honesty. I remember reading a parenting book some years ago, and the author included a series of uh, parents struggling to teach children uh, to tell the truth and their stories. One parent wrote that it's adorable when children blurt out the whole truth in their lovely, naive way. That is, until the moment when your child points and shouts out, Mummy, is that the fat lady that you don't like? Notwithstanding such mishaps, telling the truth is fortunately still held as a virtue in our society, not just for its own sake, but because truth is so closely related to trust. We all know that it's difficult to have a meaningful relationship with someone that we don't trust, whether that's a, a spouse, a partner, a colleague, or a friend, or on a wider scale, with the police, with your doctor, or with our political leaders. Trust is the vital glue that binds society together. And trust is only established when truth is told. Hence the frequent calls for public inquiries to establish what really happened on a particular issue. But in the spiritual and philosophical sphere, our society is strangely telling us that truth doesn't matter, that it's all relative. So what's true for you doesn't have to be true for me. Now, I can't say I'm a massive fan of the band Boyzone, but they sang those maybe familiar words, no matter what they tell us, no matter what they do, no matter what they teach us, what we believe is true. The Manic Street Preachers had an album, This Is My Truth, Tell Me Yours. The Eastern philosopher Cahil Gibran wrote, Say not that I have found the truth but rather I have found a truth. In our so-called tolerant society, the idea of many truths for re religion and philosophy seemingly makes for a more peaceful existence. Each of us is then able to live by our own truth. Of course, it's right that there can be no certainty about spiritual truth. My ideas have no more value than yours, no more worth. We're all grappling and guessing after truth, unless, unless revelation comes from the outside, from beyond our closed world in the here and now to reveal to us the ultimate reality beyond this life. And that, friends, is the Apostle Paul's claim in this passage. If you're a guest today, you join us as we look at this ancient letter of the Apostle Paul's to the churches in Ephesus in uh, the first century AD. It's written about 30 years or so after Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And we're trusting that God, as he promises, will speak to us through it still today 
as he did to those first century Christians. If we look back to Ephesians chapter three, verse one, it seems that Paul is about to launch into a prayer for them. He's just taught them in uh, chapter two, verses 19 and 22 of the wonder that God is building his church, who are members of his family and household, who are, verse 22, being built like a living temple into a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And so it seems he's now about to pray for them because he begins chapter three, verse one, for this reason. But then he digresses because he goes back to the phrase, if you notice that in that verse 14, for this reason, I kneel before the father. And he launches into that wonderful prayer that we're going to look at in a moment. But in the first part of our passage today, we're given this autobiographical interlude where Paul teaches again the stupendous truths about the church and about his privileged role in that revelation as an apostle of Christ Jesus. It's like a quick detour about how God has revealed his big family secret. Notice that Paul uses this word mystery uh, four times in these short passages. In the New Testament and in the ancient Greek world, a mystery is not quite how we understand it in English today. It's not like an Agatha Christie where a, a hidden secret can be worked out only by a few privileged and very clever elite detectives. No, in the New Testament, a mystery is a secret that has previously been hidden to all, but is now disclosed or revealed to all. Something that's beyond natural understanding that has only been opened to us by divine revelation through the Holy Spirit coming from the outside. That is why Christianity claims to be unique and absolute truth. Not because we're smarter than any other belief, but because this is how God has kindly, lovingly, genuinely, authoritatively revealed himself and his purposes. He's broken into our closed world as we grapple after truth and said, this is my big plan and it's great news. Listen again to Paul from verse two. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the spirit to tell God's holy uh, to God's holy apostles and prophets. And what is this mystery? Verse six. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with God's people, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise of Christ. That's, Paul big, that's, Paul, that's Paul's big deal. God's purpose, as we saw last week, which was previously hidden in the days before Christ. And is now revealed that God is creating a new humanity, a new people in Christ Jesus, made up of those who were previously alienated from one another, Jew and Gentile, but now made into this new entity called the church. Notice again, verse six, this reconciliation, this making of the church is only and always through the gospel, which begs the question, what is the gospel? Well, it's what Paul has already taught, this amazing news, a heralding of great news, Chapter two, verse four, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So as we come to believe in Jesus, as we declare in the baptism service, when we turn to Christ as saviour, when we submit to Christ as Lord, when we come to Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And then we are wonderfully adopted into this new family and household, and we inherit the boundless riches 
of Christ. The local church, you and I, are spiritual billionaires. Knowing Christ, knowing forgiveness, knowing heaven awaits, knowing reconciliation with God and with one another, knowing that we're part of his family, the church. Amongst other things, this should surely make us reevaluate what kind of wealth we want to acquire in the here and now. Spending our lives knowing and sharing Christ will prove far more enriching than amassing a vast investment portfolio or spectacular holiday experiences or whatever. As we seek to apply this passage to our lives, please can I ask you, two challenging questions. First, is there anything for which you would be prepared to go to prison? By which I don't mean uh, where you're rightly found guilty of a crime when a punishment deserves a jail term, but rather, is there a cause, a perceived injustice, a campaign about which you feel so strongly that you'd be prepared to go to prison? We've seen many this week with the Black Lives Matter campaign. Here's a completely different but second question. What do you think most unsettles Satan? The Apostle Paul gives the same answer to both these questions in this passage. The answer to both those questions from Paul's point of view is the church. Have a look at verse one and then verse 13. Paul declares that it's for the sake of the church that he's a prisoner. He asks them not to be discouraged because of my sufferings, which are for your glory, verse 13. That's a powerful testimony to the precious value of the church, that Paul is prepared to go to prison for the sake of it. But another shock of the passage is the answer to the second question. What do you think most unsettles Satan? And the answer again, quite magnificently, is the church, verse 10. Now, as we read it, what might we expect to read? Let me read it. God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the world. No, that's not what Paul says. I think we expect Paul to say that, but he actually says Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So although the world may look at All Saints, at St. Michael's and at other local churches and say we are irrelevant, a hangover from the past, redundant in modern society. And although we too may feel weak and fragile, We often appear foolish to the world outside, I suspect. The simple, breathtaking truth that we discover here is that the local church shows off, not to the world or not just to the world, but to the heavenly realms, the manifold wisdom of God. So God's angels in the heavenly realms marvel at the local church. And in it, they see God's amazing wisdom revealed. And at the same time, even as we meet today, Satan and his demons in the heavenly realms, they shudder and they are unsettled as the local church goes about our business. They too see the wisdom of God and they shudder. In other words, the triumph of God's eternal plan to gather a diverse people into his kingdom under Christ is seen in every local church. That's how precious we are and how valuable we are in God's sight. And the very practical outworking of this will be seen in every aspect of our lives. And that's what the second half of this letter is all about. The practical application of the teaching that we receive in the first three chapters. But for now, know that as we meet, every local church anywhere in the world is like one of those uh, teams celebrating on an open top bus parade, a sporting victory. But this is not just a temporary victory. A church gathering each week 
is a celebration of God's eternal spiritual victory over Satan, sin and death at the cross, which allows us, verse 12, through faith in Christ, to approach God himself with freedom and confidence. And surely that is good news indeed. Now, all that little section has been an important digression for Paul because he now gets to this prayer. And in many ways, I'd like to spend more time on it. This is like the crown jewels of prayer. We can marvel at the truths, promises and privileges we read here and learn here. The language is rich and the blessings are real. Can I encourage you to meditate on this prayer this week on your own? Study the phrases, think about them before God and use it as a springboard for your prayers. If you want some notes to help you, do contact me and I'll send you some photocopies of notes that I've found extremely helpful. And I'm going to pick out just a few gems from the crown jewels, as it were now. Here's three wonderful lessons on prayer. Not how, but who. Not how, but who. Paul is very conscious of who he is praying to, verse 14. The one to whom we pray is the one before whom we should kneel. And yet we can address him as father because we have been, as we've seen way back in chapter one, verse five, adopted to sonship. So what fuels our theology, uh, sorry, what fuels our prayer is not to be technique, but theology. So it doesn't quite matter. We don't need a, a one, two, three, four, five, six of prayer but an understanding of who God is, knowing that we can speak to the Almighty as Father. The church leader, Richard Cokin, writes, our Heavenly Father loves us passionately and perfectly. He always knows what's best for us, is always patient and kind, and is always able to provide what we need. He's generous and wise, firm in discipline, but quick to forgive and never breaks his promise. Here's another gem. Three times Paul mentions power, verse 16, verse 18, and verse 20. Not power for wealth or for healing, but for two wonderful things. Paul prays for power to be a home and power to appreciate. Power to be a home, verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The working of God's power in us is not something to be paraded, but rather the spirit floodlights Christ who comes in power to dwell in our hearts. Paul is praying in the point that he's just made earlier in the letter. So, for instance, remember when we used to have uh, friends and family to stay? Remember those days? If they came for just a short visit, then people will often just leave their stuff in their suitcases so as not to disturb the room that uh, they're staying in in the house. But when someone comes to stay permanently, well, they move in and they change everything. They put their belongings around the house, they get rid of the old stuff, they change the furniture. And so it is when the spirit of Christ moves in to us. He gradually, as it were, redecorates everywhere. He makes himself at home, literally. He makes changes in us and we work with him to do so. We become more Christ-like. Jesus, as it were, has a new home address. And he will gently, slowly, but radically change us. So if someone asks us if we've been transformed by the spirit, that can be a bit intimidating because we expect something dramatic. But it shouldn't be. And we can reply, yes, I'm allowing Christ to renovate and redecorate my heart and will. It is a great prayer to be praying for ourselves and, of course, for others as well. And to be allowing the spirit to change us is part of submitting to Christ in our emotions, our hopes, 
our dreams, our ambitions, in our thoughts, in our actions, and much more. Maybe in our tempers, maybe our language, maybe our spending, in everything. Christ wants to make his home in our hearts. And finally, Paul prays that we would have power to appreciate. Look at verses 18 and 19, that we would grasp how wide and, high and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God power to appreciate. And Paul is, of course, picking up the great themes of the letter concerning God's grace and love here. Firstly, how wide speaks of God's accepting love. If you are trusting Christ, there is nothing you can ever do that will put you outside his loving embrace. However bad you feel, know the width of God's love. How long speaks of his eternal love. He has committed to love from eternity past to eternity future. How high speaks of his exalting love. We all need to pray to appreciate and grasp how great will be the blessings of heaven. And that will help us when we doubt if it's worth uh, pursuing and keeping going as a Christian. And then how deep speaks of Christ's sacrificial love. As we sing in the hymn, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. And Paul's prayer then finishes by asking for us to see the unimaginable power that is at work within us. I'm sure that you and I can imagine quite a lot about what God could do. And yet we're told here that God Almighty, whom we can call Father, verse 20, is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. According to his work that is, his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. To which we must simply say, Amen, Amen, and Amen. The only right and proper thing to do then is to pray this prayer again. So let me use this prayer as I finish. We echo the Apostle Paul. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to uh, respond now by affirming our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come to the end of our service, we're going to sing again, Come Down, O Love Divine. It's a prayer picking up many of the themes and lessons that we've just heard in our passage.
Let's sing together. And a final prayer, again, picking up those last verses from our passage. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. I hope to see you all again soon and have a good day. God bless. Bye bye.